Odyssey, Book 7 While Odysseus was praying in the grove, the strong mules bore Nausicaa to the city. She pulled up at the gate of her father's palace, and her brothers, men like gods, crowded around, unhitched the mules, and took the clothes inside. Nausicaa went to her bedroom, where Eurymedusa, her waiting woman, kindled a fire for her. Eurymedusa had come from Epire in the curved ships long ago, and had been chosen from the spoils of war for Alcinous, who ruled the Phaeacians as if he were a god. It was this old woman who had reared white-armed Nausicaa in the palace, and who now prepared her supper on the fire. As Odysseus started out for the city, Athena enveloped him in a magic mist, so that none of the Phaeacians he might meet along the way would challenge him and ask him who he was. He was about to enter the lovely city when the gray-eyed one came up to him. She looked like a young girl, carrying a pitcher, standing there before him, and godlike Odysseus questioned her. My child, I wonder if you could guide me to the house of Alcinous, the man who is the lord of this people? I am a traveler from a far land, a stranger in need, and I know no one in this city. Athena's eyes flashed in the blue sea light. Well, of course, Grandad, I'll show you where Alcinous lives. His house is close to yours. Come on. I'll lead the way, but you'll have to be quiet. Don't look at anyone or ask any questions. The people here aren't very tolerant of strangers or very welcoming. All they trust are their ships, in which they cross the great ocean, because Poseidon lets them. Their ships are very fast, fast as a flying bird, or even a thought. Thus Pallas Athena, and she led the way, quickly, while Odysseus followed in the goddess's footsteps. None of the Phaeacians noticed him as he moved through their city, for the dread goddess, her hair done up in braids, would not allow them, shedding around him a magical mist that made him invisible. She had a soft spot in her heart for the hero. Odysseus marveled at the harbors and the shapely ships, at the meeting grounds, and the long walls capped with palisades. When they came to the king's palace, the gray-eyed one was the first to speak. Here you are, Grandad, the house you asked for. You will find the lords feasting at a banquet. Go inside and don't be afraid of anything. Things turn out better for a man who is bold, especially if he's a stranger from a strange land. The first person you'll meet is Queen Ariti, is her name, and she's from the same line as King Alcinous. It goes like this. First, Nausithous was born from Poseidon and Periboea, a most beautiful woman, the youngest daughter of Eurymedon, who once was king of the arrogant giants. He brought destruction down on his reckless people and on himself. Well, anyway, Poseidon lay with Periboea, and she bore a son, Nausithous, who ruled the Phaeacians. Nausithous fathered Rexenor and Alcinous. Rexenor had just got married when Apollo shot him with his silver bow in his hall. He didn't leave a son, but did leave a daughter, only one, Arete. Alcinous married her and honored her as no other woman on earth is honored. Of all the women who keep house for their husbands, that's how she is honored from the heart and always has been, both by her children and by Alcinous himself, as by the people who look to her as a goddess and greet her as one when she goes through the city. She understands everything and has sound judgment and settles quarrels with a generous heart. If she likes you, there is a very good chance you will get to see your dear ones again and the high-roofed hall in your own native land. Thus the goddess with the sea-gray eyes, and then she was off over the desolate water, leaving lovely Scaria. She came to Marathon and the wide streets of Athens, and she disappeared into the great house of Erechtheus. But Odysseus went to the glorious palace of Alcinous. There he stood, heart pounding as he took it all in before crossing the bronze threshold. Gleams as if the sun of the moon or the moon played over the high roof of Alcinous's house. The bronze walls surmounted with a blue enamel frieze stretched from the threshold to the inner hall. The outer doors were golden and silver doorsteps were set in the bronze threshold. The lintel was silver and the door handle gold. Flanking the door were two gold and silver dogs made by Hephaestus with all his art to guard the palace, and they were immortal and ageless. Inside, seats were built flush to the walls on either side, stretching from the threshold to the inner hall, and upon them were flung robes of a fine soft weave, the craft of women, 
The Phaeacian leaders would sit on these seats, eating and drinking, and they lacked for nothing. Golden statues of young men stood on pedestals, holding torches to light the night for banqueteers. There were fifty slave women scattered through the house, some grinding yellow grain on the millstones, others weaving cloth or twirling yarn on spindles, as they sat, fluttering like so many leaves on a poplar. And the finely woven fabric glistened with oil. For just as the Phaeacian men outstrip all others in sailing ships on the sea, so too are the women skilled above all others in working the loom. Athena has given them a deep understanding of beautiful handiwork. Outside the courtyard, just beyond the doors, are four acres of orchard surrounded by a hedge. The trees there grow tall, blossoming pear trees and pomegranates, apple trees with bright, shiny fruit, sweet figs and luxuriant olives. The fruit of these trees never perishes nor fails, summer or winter, it lasts year-round. And the west wind's breath continually ripens apple after apple, pear upon pear, fig after fig, and one bunch of grapes after another. The fruitful vineyard is planted there, too. One warm, level spot is for drying grapes in the sun. Elsewhere, some grapes are being gathered and others trod upon. In front, the unripe clusters are losing their bloom, and others are turning purple. By the last row of vines are trim plots with, with rich blooms of all sorts throughout the year. Two separate springs flow through the orchard, one of them meandering through the garden while the other flows under the courtyard threshold, and from this spring the townspeople draw their water. Odysseus stood and gazed at all the blessings the gods had lavished on the house of Alcinous. When he had taken it all in, he passed quickly over the threshold and entered the house. There he found the Phaeacian nobles, tipping their cups in honor of Hermes, to whom they poured libations last of all, when they thought it was time to take their rest. Odysseus, the godlike survivor, went through the hall in the heavy mist Athena had wrapped him in, until he came to Arete and Lord Alcinous. There he threw his arms round Arete's knees, and the magical mist melted away at that moment. They were all hushed to silence, marveling at the sight of Odysseus, who now made this prayer. Arete, daughter of godlike Rexenor, to your husband and to your knees I come in great distress, and to these banqueters also. May the gods grant prosperity to them in this life, and may each of them hand down their wealth and honor to their children after them. Grant me but this, a speedy passage home, where I have suffered long, far from my people. And with that, he sat down in the ashes by the fireside. The hall fell silent. Finally, Echenia, a Phaeacian elder, wise in the old ways and the ways of words, spoke out with good will among them. Asinous, this will not do at all. It is not proper that a guest sit in the ashes on the hearth. We are all holding back, waiting on your word. Come, help the stranger up, and have him sit upon a silver-studded chair and bid the heralds mix wine so we may pour libations also to Zeus, Lord of Thunder, who walks beside suppliants, and let the housekeeper bring out food for our guest. When the sacred king Alcinous heard this, he took the hand of Odysseus, the cunning hero, and raised him from the fireside and had him sit on a polished chair from which he asked his son Laodamus to rise, for he was Alcinous's best beloved son and sat at the right hand, a maid poured water from a golden pitcher into a silver basin for him to wash his hands, and then set up a polished table nearby. Another serving woman, grave and dignified, set out bread and generous helpings from the other dishes she had. So Odysseus, who had endured much, ate and drank, and the sacred king Alcinous spoke to the herald, Pontonus, mix the bowl and serve wine to all, so we may pour libations also to Zeus, Lord of Thunder, who walks beside suppliants. Pontonus mixed the mellow wine and served it to all, pouring out first drops for libation, which they all tipped out. When they had drunk to their heart's content, Alcinous addressed them and said, Hear me, Phaeacian lords and counselors, so I may speak to you what is in my heart. 
Now that you have feasted, go home to your rest. In the morning, we will invite more of the elders and entertain the stranger in our halls and offer fine sacrifices to the gods. Then we will think of how to convey our guest to his own native land so he may come home speedily and with joy, be it ever so far. Nor shall he suffer any harm or misfortune before he sets foot upon his own land. Thereafter, he shall suffer whatever fate the spinners spun for him when he was born. But... If he is one of the immortals come down from heaven, then the gods have changed their ways. Always before this, whenever we offered sacrifice to them, they appeared to us in their own bright forms, and they sat with us and shared the feast. Even when one of us meets them on the road, they do not conceal themselves, for we are akin, just like the Cyclopes and savage giants. Odysseus, always thinking, answered him, Don't worry about that, Alcinous. I am not like the immortals, either in build or looks. I am completely human. Better to liken me to the most woe-begone man you ever knew. That's who I'd compare myself to. I could tell you much more, a long tale of the suffering I've had by the will of the gods, but all I want now is to be allowed to eat, despite my grief. There is nothing more shameless than this belly of ours, which forces a man to pay attention to it, no matter how many troubles he has, how much pain is in his heart. I have pain in my heart, but my belly always makes me eat and drink and forget my troubles, pestering me to keep it filled. So then please do move quickly at break of day to set me ashore on my own native land, even though it be after all my suffering, I'd die gladly once I've seen my home again, my household servants and my high-roofed hall." They praised him and urged that the stranger be sped on his way. He had said all the right things. Then, when they had poured libations and drunk to their heart's content, they went home to rest. Odysseus was left behind in the hall, sitting beside Arete and godlike Alcinous. The serving women cleared away the dishes, and then white-armed Arete broke the silence. She had recognized the mantle and tunic as soon as she saw them, for she had made these beautiful clothes herself with her handmaids, and when she spoke, her words flew on wings. Stranger, I myself will ask you this first. Who are you, and where do you come from, and who gave you these clothes? Did you not say that you came here wandering over the sea? And Odysseus, never at a loss for words, It would be hard, my lady, to tell the tale of all my troubles, since the heavenly gods here have given me many, but I will tell you what you ask me about. There is an island, Ogygia, that lies far off in the sea. Atlas's daughter lives there, guileful Calypso, her hair rich as sea foam, a dread goddess. No one, mortal or divine, ever visits her. It was my bad luck to be led to her hearth by some mysterious force, all alone, washed up there after Zeus shattered my ship, silvering it with slivering it with lightning on the wine-dark sea. My whole crew went down in that wreck, but I hung on to the curved keel of my ship adrift for nine days. The tenth black night brought me to the island of Ogygia and the awesome goddess. She took me in, gave me food, and said she would make me immortal and ageless for all my days, but she never touched my heart. I spent seven years with Calypso. The immortal clothes she gave me were always wet with my tears. Then, when the eighth year came around, she told me I could go, either because of some message from Zeus or because she herself had changed her mind. She sent me off on a sturdy raft, well stocked with bread and wine, and she clothed me well and put a breeze at my back, gentle and warm. Seventeen days I sailed the deep water, and on the eighteenth day the shadowy mountains of your land appeared, and my heart was glad. But my luck turned sour, and I was soon engulfed in suffering sent by the earth shaker Poseidon. He stirred up the winds, blocking my course, and roused up huge seas that left me groaning and unable to stay with my raft, which was shattered to pieces by the hurricane winds. I swam my way through all that salt water until wind and wave brought me here to your coast. But if I had tried to come ashore, the pounding surf would have smashed me to bits on the beetling crags. I swam back out and then along the coast until I came to a river, the perfect spot, lined with smooth stones and sheltered from the wind. I staggered out, exhausted. Night was coming on. I climbed the river bank and lay down to sleep in the bushes, covering myself with dry leaves. Some god shed upon me boundless slumber, and I slept in the leaves, my heart troubled. Slept through the night, through dawn and high noon, and did not wake until the sun was going down. When I awoke, I saw your daughter's handmaids playing on the shore, and saw your daughter like a goddess among them. It was she I supplicated, and she understood everything perfectly. 
You would not expect anyone so young to act with such grace, for the young are thoughtless. She gave me bread and bright red wine, bathed me in the river, and gave me these clothes. As much as it pains me to recall, all I have told you is true. And Alcinous responded, Stranger, my daughter was out of line in not bringing you here to our house along with her handmaid, since you went first to her as a suppliant. And Odysseus, with his usual presence of mind, Do not rebuke your blameless daughter for this, my lord. She did tell me to follow along with the girls, but I refused out of fear and shame, thinking your heart might cloud over with anger. People everywhere I have found have tempers. Alcinous answered him, Stranger, my heart is not like that, to grow angry without cause. Better to give all things their due. I would wish by Zeus, by Athena and Apollo, that you, being the kind of man you are, my kind of man, would marry my daughter and stay here and be called my son. I would give you a house filled with possessions if you chose to remain, but no fiation will ever keep you here against your will. And may such a thing never please Father Zeus. As for your send-off, so you can be sure of it, it will be tomorrow. You can lie down and sleep while they row you over the calm water until you come to your home, or wherever you will, even if it is much farther away than Euboea, which our sailors say is the farthest of lands. They went there once when they took Radamanthus to visit Titius, the son of Earth. They made the round trip in a single day without even trying, but you will see for yourself how good our ships and rowers are. Odysseus, the godlike survivor, was glad, and he spoke in prayer. Father Zeus, let Alcinous accomplish all that he says. May his fame never fade over all the earth, and may I reach at last my own native land. So they spoke, and wide-armed Arete told her maids to place a bed on the porch and spread upon it beautiful purple blankets and fleecy cloaks. The maids went out of the hall with torches and made up the bed. Then they called to Odysseus, You may lie down, stranger, your bed is made. They were welcome words, and Odysseus, who had suffered much, fell asleep on the bed under the echoing portico. But Alcinous lay down in the innermost chamber of that lofty house, and his lady shared his bed and slept beside him.